Hey everyone, my name is Tomato Anus, also known as Pipsqueak Johnson, and this is an any percent speedrun of Dark Souls 2. This run is performed by the world record holder, Stennis, who also helped me write the script to make sure it's all as accurate as possible and that I don't say anything stupid. The run we're covering in this video is actually Stennis' world record, which is uploaded to his channel without commentary, so if you'd prefer to watch that version of this run, it's linked in the description. Additionally, this run is done specifically on version 1.02 of the game due to a couple pretty game-breaking glitches, so if you'd prefer to watch a run that isn't reliant on such things and more attached to regular gameplay, I've also linked the any percent current patch record by Marchi in the description as well. Also, if you haven't seen it yet, we here at Tomato Anus already covered a speedrun of the first Dark Souls, which is available for viewing on this channel. Just a heads up, it's not necessary to watch that video before watching this one. There's one concept discussed in that video that's referenced briefly in this video, but it's not required to have seen that first video to walk away with a full understanding of this video. If you've never played Dark Souls 2 before, it's pretty similar to the first in setup where it's a punishing action role-playing game with exploration being a core mechanic. There are still bonfires that serve as checkpoints and you should be proceeding through the world with caution as you explore the continuous game world. To complete this run, the main tasks we have to accomplish are to get the Ashen Mist Heart in the Dragon Shrine, to defeat the Giant Lord and claim his power for our own via the Giant's Kinship, and defeat the final boss to take the throne. Something worth noting is that because this is Stennis' record in PB, we're viewing the run with the layout he uses for his runs, so during this video you can see his inputs in the bottom left corner and his in-game time splits in the top right. With that all being covered, let's get into the run. Yo, what's good? It's your boy Pastoni Tony Marinera, and welcome back to part 23 in my series of ranking the 12 disciples and every type of pasta by how hot they are. Before we pick up where we left off by ranking Manicotti, let's get into our sponsored ranking segment where we rank Raid Shadow Legends' best Halloween champions. Coming in at a strong number 3 is Madam Saris because I like her spooky hat. At the number 2 spot on our list is Harvest Jack because he got all them little heads on his body, and that's nice and spooky to me. And number one is by far Brackus the Shifter, because I love dogs and this is one spooky dog. Like, look at him go. My favorite thing about playing Raid is throwing together a team of champions, being able to level them up at the tavern, and then just sitting back, relaxing, and watching them wreak havoc and health bars drain while I kick my legs up and maybe send some messages in chat. This month, Raid has a non-stop schedule of special events and activities with a jam-packed Halloween lineup towards the end of the month. We're talking things like big rewards tournaments, and even a brand new spooky legendary champion. If you want a head start and to dive into the events this month, hit the link in the description or scan the QR code. New players will get an epic hero Chanaru, 200,000 silver, 1 XP boost, 1 energy refill, and 1 ancient shard so you can summon an awesome champion as soon as you get in game. You'll find your rewards here in your inbox for the next 30 days only. That all being said, Manicotti is absolutely S tier. As soon as Stennis gains control, he begins sprinting forward and also holding Y on his controller to two-hand his left hand, which has nothing equipped. This slightly changes our animation when we interact with things, saving about 5 frames every time we interact. Stennis also immediately unequipped all his armor to lighten his equip load so he regains stamina slightly faster. When Stennis arrives at the door to the hut and creates his character, he names his character W, since our character actually still moves while in this menu, so naming ourselves W moves us forward slightly. For character class, Stennis selects Explorer, because then we start with a few items that are of use in the run. The important items for this class are Aromatic Ooze, which we start with 4 of and applies magic to our right hand weapon, Witching Urns, which we start with 8 of and our small magic explosives, and Life Gems, which we start with 20 of and our small health refills, which is nice to have. The Life Gems actually don't really matter in runs though once you start getting good times because when you're properly executing everything, you'll never really end up using them. For our starting gift, Stennis selects the Life Ring since it raises our max HP slightly, which isn't super important, but it's still helpful. It used to be more important in the route when leveling strats were a bit different and would make it so you just barely survive hits from a boss, but that doesn't apply with the current route anymore and is just a nice little bonus now. During the black screen after character creation, Stennis is going to hold W to move a bit forward because we have control during that screen as well and you can actually sprint well in this screen, so Stennis will do that as well. When actually exiting the hut with the fire keepers, Stennis is going to do our first proper trick of the run. When interacting with the door, Stennis will swap to the two rusted coins that we start with. 
Stennis will then sprint and purposely fall a super short distance off the small staircase and use a rusted coin at just the right time as he hits the ground. This will cause Stennis to go through the animation of using the coin, but without actually using it. While the animation plays out, Stennis will continue sprinting and our stamina won't drain. This trick can be done with more items than just the rusted coin, but the rusted coin has a long animation which makes it ideal for this trick out of the items we start with. The downside to the coin though is that because the animation is so long and also because the animation has you sit down, if you mess up your timing and fail the trick while using the coin, then your character sits down and does the animation and it's pretty much a reset. While Stennis sprints through things betwixt, I just want to mention real quick that if you're watching this video on release, there's a Speed Souls charity marathon coming up soon, running from November 4th to the 7th. You can watch it live on their Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash speedsouls, but more info on that at the end of the video. The things betwixt starting area is super straightforward in this run as we just avoid all the detours and head straight towards the exit, unequipping our explorer armor and spell quartz ring along the way. When Stennis enters Majula, he's going to ignore the tourist trap sunset and make his way straight downhill where he'll perform an angled leap to a nearby cliff face and grab a pair of binoculars that are sitting there. When doing the leap, you can actually take a risky angle where you land just on the edge and your character doesn't roll upon landing, but being just pixels off when going for that makes you fall off the cliff and die. Stennis will then immediately equip the binoculars and begin the main movement tech in the run, Bino Boosting. This is one of the two main glitches in the run and part of why this category is so short. So what is a Bino Boost? Simply put, it's a large speed boost that can last up to about 3 seconds. The way Bino Boosting is done is by looking through the binoculars, then pressing the buttons to both roll and attack at the same time, and releasing the binocular button at the end of the roll at around the time when your legs hit the ground again. Additionally, you can use an audio cue at the end of the roll to help with timing, but it's something you develop a feeling for over time. The length of a Bino Boost depends on how good your timing is for releasing the binocular button. If you time it correctly, then you get a boost that lasts the full duration of about 3 seconds. If you stop looking through the binoculars too early, you get a shorter boost, and if you stop looking a bit late, you either get a shorter boost or no boost at all. It's not exactly known how Bino Boosting works in the game's code and whatnot, it's just known that it works. Now that we're Bino Boosting away, Stennis lights the Majula Bonfire since we'll be warping back to here a couple times, and speaks to the Emerald Herald to receive our Estus Flasks, and also move the Emerald Herald closer to the Bonfire for when we warp back later. Stennis will then Bino Boost his way through Majula, through a cave, and towards the entrance of the Shaded Woods. Normally, to progress through the Shaded Woods, you need what's called a Fragrant Branch of Yore to dissolve some stone creatures blocking the way, but we're instead going to be performing a skip called Branch Skip. There's multiple steps to branch skip, but the first thing that you have to do to perform it is the second of the two major glitches, parry walking. Up front, there's a lot to parry walking, so pause the video and go grab a snack. Parry walking, in essence, lets the player go out of bounds at almost any place, letting us pass by many obstacles. To perform a parry walk, the first thing you have to do is find an enemy and parry their attack. Once the enemy is pancaked on the ground, then you have to roll towards the enemy and input a repost on the enemy. This trick is super timing dependent, with your position greatly affecting the timing, so Stennis locks onto the enemy and distances himself a few steps away from them to try and have a consistent setup. Like I just said, the timing on this is super tight, with it requiring you to repost the enemy just 4 frames after initiating the roll if you use the setup Stennis uses. When done successfully, your character will be cancelled out of the attack animation and roll past the enemy. This glitch causes you to be in a state where the game thinks you're in the repost animation still, and the enemy is pinned to the ground, but we're actually able to run around. Because the game thinks we're reposting, our vertical height slash position is locked to the pinned enemy's vertical height, so say you run off a ledge or something, you'll stay at the height that the enemy is. While in this state, you can use jumps to vary your height relative to the pinned enemy, but you need to land on something in order to change your relative height, like jumping up a staircase to raise your height, or jump and land on something lower than you, like the ground you're floating above. The ability to adjust our height comes in handy because some skips, like branch skip we're about to do, require you to be at the proper height at the beginning. Also, something worth mentioning is that because our height is locked relative to the pinned enemy's height, if the pinned enemy's vertical position changes, then our vertical position changes as well. So, if you for instance perform a parry walk on an enemy in an elevator and pin them there, and then the elevator goes up or down, the vertical position of the enemies will increase or decrease, in turn increasing or decreasing our vertical position. 
Performing a parry walk on an enemy on an elevator is something that isn't used in runs today, but has been explored for more skip-heavy categories like reverse boss order. The timing to do a parry walk varies slightly based on what type of enemy you parry, the distance you are to the enemy, as well as any obstacles, slopes, rocks, or anything of that nature on the ground. Like I said before though, the rule of thumb is to roll about 4 frames before the repost. If you press the button to repost too early, then your character will actually repost the enemy on the ground. If you repost slightly too late, then you'll get no repost at all, but also no parry walk. And lastly, if you repost way too late, then you get a rolling attack. There's two main ways to break a parry walk. The first is simply that if you quit out, then your parry walk breaks. The second way of breaking a parry walk and returning to normal movement is by loading into a new area, despawning the pinned enemy in the process. Loading into a new area isn't as simple as just walking into a new area though. Walking into the vicinity of a new area will cause things like some items and bonfires to load in, but not the area itself, which is what we need to have loaded in order to unload the previous area along with the pinned enemy. Loading into a new area in Dark Souls 2 actually requires you to walk up a slope. Yes, you heard that right, walk up a slope. It's not 100% understood why this is, but Stennis does have a working theory behind it. So, if you watched my video covering the any% percent speedrun of the first Dark Souls, you likely remember that your position is constantly being updated and saved as long as you're walking on what's referred to as stable ground. Dark Souls 2 operates slightly differently, where instead of your position being constantly updated and saved, you actually have to walk around a little bit on the ground for the game to register and save your location. When you're parry walking, you're usually slightly hovering over flat ground, so if you run straight, you're probably not touching the ground with every step, meaning you aren't in contact with the ground, so the game isn't registering where you are. Similarly, you're definitely not touching the ground with every step when you're parry walking and running down a slope. However, if you're running up a slope, you are touching the ground since it's pushing you up, meaning you accumulate enough steps hitting the ground for the game to register where you are. This means that to get the game to load in a new area for us, we have to run up a slope in the new area so that the game understands where we are and loads in the level around us. So the way you'll see us get out of parry walking in this run is by running up a slope in the new areas, however slight that slope may be. So, once Stennis performs the parry walk on the forest grotesque and has his height fixed to the stone platform he's on, he'll run in Bino Boost off the stone platform and jump onto a broken stone pillar. On the pillar, Stennis will angle himself slightly towards the left side and simply sprint towards the wall, causing him to clip out of bounds where his height will remain fixed since he's still parry walking. Out of bounds, Stennis will then run around to the back of the stone building and run into the center of the back of some stairs, being sure to not go too close to the building on the way or he'll bump into things with collision that cause us to lose our parry walk and fall into the void. Once he's wedged himself under the stairs, Stennis is going to angle himself 45 degrees to the right which will cause the character to start shaking at which point Stennis will perform 4 jumps while holding this angle. After the four jumps, Stennis will then perform one jump while facing directly to the right and follow this by performing two final jumps straight back. In order to understand what these seven jumps do, we need to talk about one final concept in regards to parry walking. So, Dark Souls 2 has a procedural animation system where, based on how your character is facing and the terrain, the character animation automatically adapts to collision, which is why you can get some pretty funky animations in Dark Souls 2. This locomotion system was likely designed to make the game look smoother, but it does have some weird effects. When we're in the glitched state that is parry walking, the game has sort of split our character into two different positions. One is the visual position, which is the one that we see and interacts with the terrain to make animations look better, and is the actual character on screen. The other position is our logical position, which is the actual position of our character in terms of where we actually are in the world and is the position of us that can actually interact with things like items. Think of it as kind of like a ghost version of us that can walk through walls if we walk into a wall with collision and keep holding forward. If you do that, then on screen your character will just be slamming their head into the wall as you walk into it continually. When we're parry walking though, our logical positioning actually goes through the wall and is walking around on the other side. If we walk forward into the wall for the amount of time that would have us travel, say, 15 feet, our visual self is stuck walking into the wall, but our logical self is 15 feet on the other side of the wall. If we then turn around and try to walk away from the wall, our visual self will actually still be stuck at the wall trying to run away from it. 
It's only once our logical self moves that 15 feet to get back in bounds at a valid location for us to stand that our visual self snaps to the position of the logical self and moves around with our inputs. Over long distances, you can actually see that it takes some time for our visual position to catch up to our logical position. The game is constantly trying to drag the visual position over to the logical position, but collision prevents it. Because of the way this locomotion system works and the way parry walking breaks it, there can be a lot of jittery movement in this run. Additionally, something just worth noting is that because the logical positioning of ourselves is the part of us that interacts with items and whatnot, we can technically walk through a wall with our logical self and pick up an item on the other side of the wall. So let's bring this all back to branch skip and Stennis performing a ton of jumps while under these stairs. So, our goal is to get to a valley past this stone building and progress through this section of the world. The thing is though, the valley is actually at a higher elevation than where we are now, and the enemy we pinned and are fixed to isn't anywhere near the height we need to be to get into that valley and walk along an upward slope to load that area and progress through the game. Additionally, there's an invisible wall if we just follow the path at this height, in addition to some spots that can trigger infinite loading screens if we're too low. That's where the jumps come into play. Because we're wedged under the stairs, every time we jump, we gain height but hit our heads on the stairs, pushing us into the ground and stopping our jump before we ever actually begin falling. This means that every time we jump, we gain height to our logical position since it goes up, but we never actually fall since we touch the ground immediately. As long as you don't slide out from under the stairs, which is serving as our makeshift roof, then you can do these jumps as much as you want to keep stacking height. It's with this series of jumps that Stennis gains enough height to be at around the height of the valley, and once he has gained enough height, he aims directly away from the stairs and Bino boosts, getting himself unstuck and allowing the game to snap him back to his logical position. After snapping back to reality, we're able to progress through the valley, purposefully running to some branches to hit a load trigger for the items and bonfire in this area, followed by running through a boulder and some more branches to a point where Stennis will break the parry walk by eventually walking up a slope in bounds, officially loading in and welcoming us to the shaded woods. Alright, time to see all these concepts come together in real time. Once we're in the shaded woods and without parry walks, Dennis continues bino boosting past some forest grotesques and runs up to and lights a bonfire so that we can warp back to it later. Stennis then bino boosts out the leftmost upstairs exit and zooms past some more forest grotesques before eventually bino boosting past a flexile sentry to grab a golden falcon shield that was left by some littering hikers. We'll be using the golden falcon shield to do parry walking from here on out, so on his way up to the next area, Stennis equips it in addition to using an Estus to top off his health and unequipping most of our items, leaving only our life gems, witching urns, and aromatic ooze, which will be used later in the run. One of the forest grotesques follows Stennis up here, where Stennis performs a parry walk on them, followed by jumping up onto the mound that's on the edge of this upper area. There, Stennis will then wedge himself into a specific spot in some branches at a specific angle and perform 11 jumps with the branches acting as our ceiling to increase our logical height again. After the 11 jumps, Stennis then runs at an angle to the left in Bino Boost to break himself free, shooting him across the area where Stennis then runs through a specific tree to hit a trigger to load the items in Aldia's keep. Stennis then comes to a King's Gate that's invisible and unloaded, which he scales by just running forward at it, spitting him out in Aldia's keep and breaking the parry walk in the process. This skips the need for the King's Ring that you get from Vendrick in the Undead Crypts. Aldia's Keep is a pretty linear path to follow, where we'll be running in a straight line for a bit. Once Dennis gets inside, he'll trigger a scripted invasion, but we'll zoom through the encounter room so quickly that the computer invader leaves. Here, Stennis Bino boosts past Bone Guy, who's taking a nap and blocking a staircase, but Stennis is able to cut a corner and make it to the next floor thanks to his speed, skipping a minor detour we'd have to take otherwise. At the top, Stennis pulls the Yank Chain on the Dragon Statue to open the door behind the statue. 
In the corridor behind the door, Stennis will knock a painting to the floor for an enemy to pour from where they were stored, and enemies we abhor, so Stennis will parry walk them to pin them to the floor. After parry walking the guy from Scooby-Doo who stares at you from behind paintings, Stennis runs to the end of the hallway where he bonks his head continually against the right side of the door so he doesn't get hit when Shrek from Shrek breaks the door and we run past. At the next door we get some noodle arms because today was pull day at the arm farm, and at the next door Stennis again stands on the right side of the door so that Shrek from Shrek 2 doesn't hit him when he destroys the door. As soon as he bursts through the other side, Stennis does a jump and lands on the slightly elevated part of the walkway, slightly increasing his parry walk height so that he can just run around the arena housing the guardian dragon and walk onto the path on the other side to complete the skip. When Stennis gets to the other side of the arena, his parry walk breaks when he gets back on the path and he then takes a long elevator ride up, doing some menuing while he waits. Stennis equips the Estus Flask and the Dark Sign, and then uses the multi-select feature to drop the Pharos' Lockstone, Rusted Coin, and Prism Stone all at once, followed by dropping our Dagger and Crescent Axe that was picked up with our Shield because we'll be getting our main weapon very soon. At the end of the menuing, Stennis sorted the items twice by selecting default positions, which makes it so that on the second sorting press, the items are in reverse order. We're going to be picking up a soul soon, and this makes it so that it spawns in the third spot, so it's quicker to menu too. At the top of the elevator, Stennis will run outside and be in the Dragon Airy. Similar to the previous area, this one is a pretty straight shot as we make our way to get the Ashen Mist Heart. After running over the first bridge in a moment, Stennis will keep Bino boosting past the bonfire, back outside, up a spiral slope, and then over another bridge. At the end of that bridge, Stennis will run through another cave where he'll run up another slope that spits him out in a dragon's nest. There, Stennis will run near the dragon to bait out an attack, then run and crush an egg that's blocking his way to old trusty, old reliable, old faithful dragon tooth. Serves that baby dragon from the end of Shrek 2 right for blocking our path. After grabbing the weapon he'll use for the rest of the run, dropping through a hole and landing on an egg, Stennis will run over a bridge and make sure to bind a boost as he reaches the end of the bridge. There he'll take a sharp left and leap across a gap to the area to our left which saves 8-10 to 10 seconds in this run as opposed to not going for the jump at all and picking up a second soul. Speaking of souls, here Stennis is on a quick detour where he bino boosts into another area with a dragon and grabs the soul of a great hero that's on the ground. After bino boosting out, Stennis runs back to the bridge he ran past a second ago and crosses it to enter the dragon shrine. In the Dragon Shrine, Stennis is going to be bino boosting up a series of stairs, looking like I do after I get back to my apartment when I really have to pee. After Stennis Bino Boosts past some initial enemies, he's going to time out where he's Bino Boosting to make sure that he's Bino Boosting at the correct time, which is while he's nearing the top of the exterior stairs here. While he does this, he hugs the left wall, and after taking a left, he continues to hug the left of this open area to manipulate the Drake Keepers to move away from the door so we can open it and roll to dodge one of their attacks right as we finish opening the door. After the following door, there's a long stretch of stairs we have to get all the way to the top of, with enemies littered all throughout. Stennis times out his boost locations and tries to get a full length each time to make sure he's able to easily get by all the enemies. At the top of the stairs, Stennis speaks with the Ancient Dragon to receive the Ash and Mist Heart and presses both A to talk and X to use the Dark Sign in rapid succession by rolling his thumb over the buttons. This uses the Dark Sign as we're talking, causing us to warp back to our last bonfire at the cost of all our souls, which, oh no, we're losing zero souls, how will we ever recover from this? The dialogue with the dragon is timed out just right, so we receive the Ashen Mist Heart as we warp back to the Shaded Woods, where Stennis will then warp back to Majula. In Majula, Stennis is going to be performing an item dupe on the soul of a great hero we picked up so that he gets a ton of souls quickly to be able to level up a lot without having to farm souls. The way to do an item dupe is to use the item, then leave the menu where the item is located, then return and drop the item before it disappears from our inventory as it's being used. The button presses for this is to use the item, then press L1, then R1 to go to the equipment screen and back, then going down and over to the soul and leaving it. This is why it was important for Stennis to sort the items twice earlier to reverse the order of the items. This way, the soul is near the front so he's able to quickly leave it, otherwise the window where he can drop the soul is too tight to be able to do it consistently. After the first use of the soul, Stennis picks up the soul again and initiates the dialogue to level up with the Emerald Herald and presses start just after pressing A to open the menu and use the soul a second time to bring his total soul count to 40,000 as the dialogue progresses. For levels, Stennis will bring his dexterity up to 10 and strength up to 27. This is because to properly wield Dragon Tooth two-handed you need 10 dex and 25 strength, but Stennis uses all his souls to bring strength up to 27 to have slightly faster fights later on. Bearer of the curse. 
After leveling up, Stennis will then make his way to the Forest of Fallen Giants by Bino Boosting, where he'll do a face pull to open a door. Despite how it looks when he waits for the door to open in a moment, you can't actually run or roll under the door when there's seemingly enough space for it. You have to wait for it to be considerably more open than you'd think before you can move, but Stennis knows the timing pretty well and Bino boosts at the earliest possible moment to move on. Once he enters the forest proper, Stennis is going to run down the slope to the nearest hollow infantry to get its attention and lure it back up towards the entrance to the area. This is to get the hollow infantry away from other enemies and also to the proper height for a parry walk. Once Stennis performs the parry walk, he'll simply run into the rocks on his left, causing him to clip out of bounds. Now that we have the Ashen Mist Heart, we're able to trigger the memories of giants, and one specific memory is where we'll defeat the Giant Lord and obtain the Giant's Kinship, which we need to have to complete the game. To the left up here is where Stennis runs into a staircase, loading the area around him and breaking the parry walk, also skipping a King's Gate and the requirement for the King's Ring as a whole. After interacting with the body of the giant, Stennis is brought into the memory of Jay. When Stennis is in the memory, he's going to stand on the far right of the fog gate at the start, and once he's on the other side, stay to the right side and attempt to time out several full-length bino boosts. When you run through this area, there's a giant boulder that drops down and clears out everything before the giant lord, but with bino boosting and optimal pathing, not only can you beat the boulder to the punch, but you can turn the boulder into a punch on the giant lord. If you perform the Bino boost optimally and have optimal pathing, the Giant Lord will be baited into the path of the boulder as it falls into the alley, dealing a solid chunk of damage. Additionally, when you arrive at the Giant Lord, the strat is to apply an aromatic ooze for extra damage and to begin two-handing Dragon Tooth during your final boost. Once you do that, the game plan for the fight is to hit the Giant Lord with a set series of attacks, initiated with a double R2, followed by three double R1 attacks, and finishing off the Giant Lord with another double R2. That's the game plan at least going into the fight, assuming you land the boulder attack. Unfortunately, in this run, the world record run, Stennis wasn't so lucky and the boulder actually missed the giant lord. This is a time loss of somewhere between 8 to 10 seconds and typically is a dead run, but the rest of this run was good enough that Stennis had to keep going. When you miss the boulder, the general plan is to initiate the fight with a double R2 to start, followed by four series of R1 and R2 combos, and finishing off with a double R2. The main idea is to start and finish with double R2s because it's too risky to use double R2 at other times in the fight when the Giant Lord has less downtime between attacks. R1 into R2 is slightly slower than double R1, so you have to be quick to react and manage to build as much stamina as possible between attacks to chain together so many R1, R2 combos back to back. Additionally, Dark Souls 2 has a mechanic where if you do an attack with less stamina than it normally consumes, you actually deal less damage, so stamina is key here because if you don't pay attention to it, the Giant Lord can easily end up having a sliver of health left. I know I just said the main idea is to start with double R2s, but in this run, not only did Stennis have a missed boulder, but he also got hit by the hilt of the Giant Lord's sword in the opening attack because he stood slightly too far back into the right, which didn't leave Stennis with enough time to somewhat safely do the double R2. And even on top of that, the strats Stennis implements aren't technically 100% safe because on rare occasions the Giant Lord can do a really fast stomp that kills you even if you did everything right. Alright, now that we have all that context and info out there, let's see this fight in real time. While the fight plays out, I'd just like to remind you, as always, that no feeling is final. Feelings of dread, hopelessness, or despair do not define the rest of your life, and things will get better. There is a tomorrow, you will be here for it, and the world is a better place with you in it. I know that things might seem absolutely overwhelming at times, and you might be unable to not think about awful things going on. But please, please, please remember though that those feelings and thoughts are fleeting and do not define who you are or the rest of your existence. There will be a time in the future where those thoughts will be a memory of where you were rather than who you were or are. Again, please remember that no feeling is final and it's okay to talk to others and it's okay to seek help. You are not alone. Once Stennis takes down the Giant Lord, he uses the Dark Sign to warp back to Majula, being awarded the Giant Lord's Soul and Giant's Kinship as he's warping. We can now make our way to the final fights of the game to round out the run, so after arriving in Majula, he then warps back to the Shaded Woods where he'll unequip Dragon Tooth, then periwalk a nearby forest grotesque.
In this run, Stennis actually fails the parry walk on the first attempt, which causes the other nearby forest grotesques to ambush him, but Stennis has ice in his veins and was able to successfully perform the parry walk on one of the ambushing grotesques. Once he has the parry walk, Stennis bino boosts into a wall at an angle next to a big rock, causing him to climb over it and go out of bounds. As Stennis bino boosts over the void, he'll eventually approach a tunnel that he needs to enter, and as he approaches it, he clips an upward slope briefly, causing the area around the tunnel to load in, breaking the parry walk and dropping him down in front of the tunnel to Drangleek Castle. Stennis then runs through the tunnel and up a series of stairs, passing an enemy on the way, making sure he's close enough for the enemy to attack so the enemy follows faster, and eventually reaches the top where he grabs some holy water urns behind a rock. Stennis equips the urns while waiting for the royal swordsman to haul ass up the stairs, and once he does, Stennis knocks his gassed ass to the ground and performs the final parry walk of the run on him. Stennis then runs off the nearby ledge and runs towards Dringleek Castle proper, equipping Dragontooth again while running. There's a ton of kill boxes in the area we parry walk through here, so Stennis takes a wide berth to the right of the structure to avoid them all. Stennis then runs into a specific spot of wall or rock or whatever to go straight through and not hit any kill boxes, then runs straight at a light spot on the wall texture ahead. When crossing through this texture, he bumps into the torch that's the source of this light, loading this new area and breaking the parry walk and welcoming us to the Throne of Want. Stennis then bino boosts to the nearby fog gate and prepares for the penultimate fight of the run. This fight is against two bosses at once, the Throne Watcher and the Throne Defender. There's a ledge with a pit on the side of this arena, and Stennis is going to use that to his advantage. The main idea behind this strat is to lure the Throne Watcher, the one in white, to the ledge and get them to fall off, then fight the Defender as normal. In order to do this, Stennis first needs to draw out an attack from the Defender while maintaining as much distance as possible from the Watcher. The pair will be somewhat passive for a tiny bit after the Defender's attack, so keeping distance from the Watcher is key to avoid them from either attempting an attack or starting to rush in on us. So Stennis uses the Defender to basically body block the Watcher. Stennis then doubles back towards the Fog Gate, again to maintain distance from the Watcher, and heads to the corner of the arena which will act as the fall off point. As he heads over, Stennis also uses an aromatic ooze in preparation for his duel with the Defender. Stennis will then stand in the corner with his left leg on one of the raised tiles and his right leg on the ground and block the Watcher's attack that they throw out when they approach us while also being locked onto them. As soon as he blocks the attack, Stennis will then move to the left and pass the Watcher with relatively tight timing, causing the Watcher to fall out of the arena as they turn to look at us. Additionally, this strategy requires the Watcher to throw out one specific attack for this to work. Any other attack they might do doesn't cause her to fall off, but luckily with precision in the pathing and position that Stennis takes, the needed attack happens more frequently than the others. Stennis can't bait the Defender over the ledge, so he has to actually fight them, but let's see the fall off first before getting into the Defender fight. When fighting the Defender, Stennis will continually do R2 attacks since every other attack staggers the Defender. At one point, Stennis hits the Defender with a Witching Urn while Stennis recovers stamina, which takes off just enough health to take a cycle off of our attack pattern. Once he takes out the Defender, he'll have a moment of preparation for the final boss fight of the run, which is against Nishandra. Because this is the base game and an old patch, the Scholar of the First Sin release patch is not applied. In the current patch, if you kill Vendrick and go through all of Aldia's dialogue, Aldia will spawn as the final final boss. That means that this run officially ends after we defeat Nishandra and take the Throne of Want. There's a really cool strat to killing Nishandra in this run, and it's called Nash Glitch. After defeating the Defender, Stennis doesn't dismiss the item box from killing the duo because it comes in handy as a visual indicator in a moment. Stennis will then move to a specific spot in the arena and look at a specific angle by using the visual cue of aligning the U in Holy Water Urn with the bottom of a tile on the wall. As soon as the item box closes by itself, Stennis will then hold forward and roll, then spam to throw the Holy Water Urns which hit Nishandra as she spawns in, freezing her in place. Additionally, Stennis holds start during this to immediately skip the cutscene because otherwise the cutscene ruins the timing of the trick. Then, after Nash Glitch and after Stennis takes down Nishandra, he'll wait for the Victory Achieved text to pop up and then use the Dark Sign to reset his position in the arena, putting him closer to our final destination. 
Using the dark sign to do this is actually a bit slower in real time, but with the official no loads timing method that the community uses with live split, using the dark sign is around 2 seconds faster. For the fight, Stennis alternates between doing double R2 combos and throwing a Witching Urn, which will happen four times. The Witching Urns are used while Stennis is recovering stamina and help take a cycle off of the fight. After the fourth Witching Urn, Stennis will then finish off the fight with another double R2, which kills Nishandra. As soon as the victory achieved text pops up, Stennis will then use the Dark Sign to reset his position and put himself closer to the throne, and as soon as he loads in, he Bino boosts one final time to the Throne of Want, ending both the game and the run. If you made it to the end of this video, thank you so much on behalf of both myself and Stennis. Stennis was so incredibly helpful in making this video be a possibility and was also incredibly understanding and flexible with trying to get this video to you all as soon as possible. If you'd like to check out Stennis' Twitch or YouTube channels, they're both linked in the description. Also, if you enjoyed this run and want to check out more speedruns of the Soulsborne series as a whole, then check out speedsouls.com. It's an enormous speedrunning community with an incredibly active Discord server, and the community has made some ridiculously well-documented and thorough notes and guides regarding just about everything you could think of. And also, like I mentioned 31 minutes and 20 seconds ago, the Speed Souls community is hosting their annual charity marathon from November 4th to the 7th. The marathon will be raising money for Save the Children and will include runs from just about every Soulsborne game, as well as speedruns of some other games as well. You can view the schedule by googling Speed Souls Charity Marathon 2021 and watch the event happen live at twitch.tv slash speedsouls. Additionally, thank you, as always, to everyone who supports the Tomato Anus channel on Patreon. It's entirely unnecessary, but you choose to do it anyway. If you'd like early access to videos and access to versions without sponsor reads, you get both of those by contributing literally $1 a month to the Patreon. Additionally, you get to participate in future suggestion threads and polls to decide what speedruns are covered on this channel. Any support is greatly appreciated, but again, it's entirely unnecessary. And lastly, as always, check out the Tomato Anus Discord server. The people there are incredibly welcoming and supportive and just sweet people through and through. If you have something you'd like to talk about, I'm sure there will be people there willing to chat with you. That's all for this video though. This was an any% percent speedrun to beat Dark Souls 2. I've been Tomato Anus, and I hope you have an above average day.